creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. So great to be here with you. Glad to see all of you. Want to welcome those of you joining us online or watching this later in the recorded version. We're so thankful to have this opportunity to come and sing praises to God, open His Word, uh, learn and grow and fellowship as His people. So let's begin with a word of prayer, if you'd bow with me. Father, we just humble ourselves before you today, and we're so thankful for who you are, for what you've done for us. Lord, we praise you uh, for your infinite holiness and power and glory. And God, we come today and uh, seek you. We humble ourselves and, and uh, know that, Father, our, our only hope is in you. And so we come today just asking that you would uh, just, uh, just speak to us today, teach us, guide us, direct us, just bless this time as we study, as we read your word, as we love each other, as we sing praises to your name. We pray your spirit would be here with us. We love you and thank you, God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning and praise the Lord together today. Good morning, y'all.
Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Here we go. For God so loved the world that. from Psalms. <clears throat> this is Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness it tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could
the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim
one more time. You may be seated. Father God, we come humbly before you today. Lord, as we open your word, we know the power that resides within it. Father, we know that your words bring life. Lord, we come before you this morning just to ask that you would just equip each of us by the power of your spirit to hear from you today, that you would just illuminate your truth to our hearts and our minds and our very lives. Father, I ask that you have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, you would blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, create in me, O oh Lord, a new heart, a right spirit, renew within me the desire to follow you, restore to me the joy of your salvation, Father, that my lips would be opened, that my mouth would be empowered by you to declare your praise. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Today we move forward in the book of James, chapter 2. We're going to move into um, our next section, which we'll actually finish James chapter 2 this morning. Begin in verse 14 and end in verse 26. hope you've been encouraged so far by the study of James, and today has such a powerful um, statement of understanding about a concept that we've all faced. If you've spent any time around religious activity at all, you've faced this tension or this balance between two extremes. James talks about them today. One extreme is faith, one is works. James says they both go together, they both have this intimate relationship, but if you're not careful, you drift to one extreme or the other. We've probably all been tempted to drift, or we've all known someone that has, we've all seen the outcome of that, right? So if you drift too far on the faith aspect and get out of line, then what you have is just some doctrinal statement that you've said you believe in, and that's it. You've just said, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live my life. The opposite end is this idea of works where you've just said, hey, I'm just going to be a good person. Just going to do some good stuff, and hopefully God will be pleased with me, and in the process, my good will balance out and outweigh my bad. Right? So we know both of those are in error because both of those by themselves don't save. What James says in the middle of that, in the mingling of those two concepts, the beautiful mingling of faith and works is the picture of genuine, salvific, or saving faith. 
So we need to hear what James, the brother of Jesus, said about it. So read with me, and then we'll have a few things to say. Uh, James chapter 2, beginning of verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So what James teaches here is this balance between what we would call easy believism versus works-based salvation. Can we understand those terms? Easy believism is just say, hey, I, Jesus sounds cool, I believe in him. And there's nothing else after that. That's easy believism. Whereas the opposite extreme is this works-based salvation where you say, well, I'm just going to do a bunch of good stuff and God's surely going to be pleased with me. Right? So we know both of those are in error. So let's talk about... Um, what we're going to see as we unpack these verses here over the next few minutes is we'll see the description of genuine faith. But before we do, let's look at three inadequate views that are commonly held about faith. Right? There's three things that all of us can probably relate to that are inaccurate or in, in, you know, incapable of really bringing salvation, but we often cling to them if we're not careful. Three inadequate views of faith that James points out. First of all, uh, the first thing that just leaves us short is that of good intentions. Good intentions are good. I mean, I have them. Right? Every day I wake up and say, man, today I'm not going to do those things, and I am going to do these things. And more times than not, I fail at that. Right? I have good intentions. I want to do what's right. I want to stay away from that, which would be destructive. But oftentimes I fail. And so James talks about that. Right? He says, what good is it? Um, you know, if you see someone that's lacking and you have the ability to meet their need, and you say, well, go, be, be warm, be filled. I hope you have what you need, right? James says, that, that's crazy. If you say, I have good intentions, and we all do, I hope that all of us have good intentions that others would do well and be filled and be warm and have their needs met, and that's good. And, and in our own life, we all have intentions, I believe are good, but James says, that, that's good. But that's not the total sum of a genuine saving faith, right? We have to go beyond good intentions. John said this, 1 John 3. I'll just read it for you this morning, verse 16. He says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives also for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth, right? So James says good intentions are good, but they're just one part. They're not complete faith, right? So good intentions, as much as we like to have good intentions, uh, we can't just say, yeah, I'd like for these things to turn out. There's actually works, there's action, there's results, there's fruitfulness that shows that faith is more than just good intentions. Number two, the second kind of inadequate view of faith that, that James calls out is that of just mere theological knowledge. He gives this kind of bold statement here where he says, hey, you guys believe, right? You have some faith. You believe that God is who he said he is. That's great. But you know what? Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. Jesus talked about this in Luke 4. Jesus cast out some demons. You know what those demons did when Jesus cast them out? They immediately recognized who he was, and they were emotionally driven. They cried out, you are the son of God. 
That was something that people didn't know at that point because Jesus said, don't, he didn't allow him to tell anybody. He said, don't tell anybody that. He wasn't ready for that to be revealed. But what we see is these demons who were evil and fallen and wicked, when they saw Christ, they immediately knew who he was and they were stirred with emotion. And so James uses that as a comparison to say, look, if all you have is some theological knowledge about who Jesus is, even if that's coupled with some emotion and some you know, internal stirring of your heart, that's not enough because even the demons possess that, yet they're not saved, right? The demons have accurate theological knowledge about who Jesus is, what he came to do, and that knowledge even stirred some emotion in them, yet they were still fallen demons. And so J James says, that's great if you know God is one. It's great if you know theological terms. It's great if they even move you to be emotional. He says, but that's not salvation. Now, we should note here, the Bible says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so one of the ways we love God with all of our mind is we should be on a constant pursuit of all that we can know about who God is, what he has said, what he has done. Theological, intellectual pursuit of God is healthy, and it glorifies God. I would even say it equips us. And so that's a good thing. But what James points out here is that that's not the end in itself. That theological knowledge, deep biblical understanding, even coupled with emotion, puts us on the same level as the demons who shuddered when they saw Christ because they knew who he was. They knew the theological component. And so what James says here is that while theological knowledge and intellectual assent to a set of absolute facts and studying facts is absolutely required, but even that in itself is not a genuine faith by itself. Warren Wiersbe, pastor, who wrote a commentary on the book of James, said this, Beware of a mere intellectual faith. Listen, no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come into contact with a 220-volt wire and remain the same. Right, he goes on and says, Any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life and good works is a false declaration. That kind of faith is a dead Faith, because he who has the Son has life, and where there is life, there is growth. So Wearsby says, hey, if you come to Christ with just some intellectual agreement with some terms and some facts, then that's a dead faith. He said, you can't come to Christ by genuine faith and ever be the same again, just like you can never touch a high-voltage wire and never be the same again. I mean, that's going to affect you negatively, whereas encountering Jesus Christ by genuine saving faith changes the rest of your life in such a positive way that there's just no disputing that Christ reigns in your heart. And so, and so we see that theological knowledge by itself is just not a proof of saving faith. Um, it's been said by many theologians throughout the ages, this, this famous statement that says, it is faith alone that justifies, but a faith that justifies will never be alone. Right? So genuine faith always brings evidence of the Spirit's work in our life through fruitfulness, through the result of what comes out. So that's point two. Point three, the third inadequate view of faith is that of religious accomplishments. While they're good, they don't save. I've said this many times, and you're probably tired of hearing me say it, but that's a good thing if you're tired of hearing me say it, because that means it's in your mind, right? And it's this thought that we can't look at our spiritual report card, and try to justify ourselves by our works. We all have a spiritual report card, whether you know it or not, right? We count in our mind all the things we've done for God, all the things that were bad that we stayed away from, all the times we came to church, all the wonderful things we've done. Those are absolutely good. We'll talk about those at the completion of the sermon, about how those show faith. But what we can't do is say, man, look at me. Look at all I've done. Look how good I am. God must be pleased with me, because what we see is that we are utterly wicked and unable to come to God with anything of value. And so we just see that religious accomplishments, achievements, patting ourselves on the back about doing religious things is not genuine faith. Jesus told a story in Luke 10 that illustrates that, the story of the Good Samaritan. If you're not familiar with it, let me just paraphrase it. Jesus said there was once a man traveling down a road, and he fell in the hands of robbers. He was harmed. He was beaten. He was hurt badly. There was a priest and a Levite, 
both of which, priest and Levite, were both religious positions that were highly esteemed. Jesus said the priest goes by, then the Levite goes by. They were both on their way to a religious place to do major religious things. They didn't have time to stop and deal with some Samaritan, or stop, stop, excuse me, stop and deal with some person who'd been robbed. Rather, a Samaritan came by, who a Samaritan would have been an outcast, a, a person not highly thought of, but the Samaritan, just a common person, came by, stopped, cared for the person, provided for his needs, put him up in an inn on his own dime, made sure that he was taken care of. And so Jesus tells this story to illustrate the fact that the priest and the Levite both had tremendous theological training, both had tremendous, a tremendous resume of great religious accomplishments. They both could defend their faith with extreme accuracy, but they chose not to demonstrate their faith by actually doing just a basic act of love and kindness. As John said, how can the love of God be in you when you have the, the means to meet a need for someone and you choose not to? And so we just see here that even the priests and the Levites, highly esteemed as they were, Jesus uses them an example, pointed to them and said, that is not genuine faith. Yes, they had tremendous accomplishments, but they failed at demonstrating their faith in such a simple, basic, everyday way showed that they truly didn't understand what was going on inside them. So another place I want to turn for a moment, if we talk about how, how do we know our faith is real, that's a huge question. How do I know that I'm not just spinning my wheels with some kind of man-made religious system? How do I know that I'm in Christ, that my eternity is certain, that he has called me his own, that he's working in me? We'll go to the Old Testament 1 Samuel. Talked about it last week. I want to expand on it a little more. 1 Samuel is a very powerful place to turn to understand how God works in the life of believers. What's going on here in Samuel, just a quick recap. Um, this is the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. God has divinely provided for them time after time after time. And time after time after time, they've gotten humanly and, and tried to take matters into their own hands and and forget to be thankful and forget where their provision really came from. But God continues to provide. And so early on, God provides by giving them Moses to lead them. And then Moses, he transitions to uh, Joshua to lead them. And then there's this period where God chooses to raise up various judges to keep his people straight. And so these judges are empowered by the Spirit of God to lead and to direct and to guide. And then we were find a place in 1 Samuel where Samuel, who is the last great judge, has this encounter with the Lord where the people have become selfish once again. They've forgotten how God has provided in so many miraculous ways. And they start looking at their enemies who all have kings. And they say, that's what we want. We want a king. We want a monarch. We want what those people have. And so God comes to Samuel. And Samuel, as you can imagine, is kind of you know downtrodden about that or depressed and and in verse 7 of chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, God says to Samuel, they have not rejected you, they've rejected me as their king. God says, I've provided in more ways they can even remember or count, but yet for whatever reason, they still want to act as if they have human means of provision, right? They want a king so they can control what's going on, they want to take matters into their own hands, they want to do good works on them, by themselves, they want to depend upon their own strength. The Lord says, I'm going to let them do it. And so the Spirit comes upon Samuel and anoints King Saul to be the first king of the nation of Israel. And so Samuel has this Spirit-led interaction where he helps Saul prepare for the office of king. And the Spirit did mighty, mighty things through Saul, allowed him to have victory over enemies, allowed him to have wisdom and knowledge and direction and all these wonderful things. But multiple times, Saul tries to take matters into his own hands, and he tries to wrap it in religious language. He tries to characterize it and justify it as if he's kind of following God, but then, you know, God obviously would probably want me to do some things on my own too. And so he does that, and three major times he fails. He rebels against God by trying to take matters into his own hands. And so even though the Holy Spirit of God had been with him and empowering him and equipping him and giving him victory, he continued to take matters into his own hands. Finally, the Holy Spirit reaches a point where he departs from Saul. He leaves Saul and anoints a new king, young David. The Holy Spirit rushes upon David and equips him and anoints him and empowers him and guides him. But guess what Saul does? He continues to try to be in charge. He continues to think, man, look what all I've done. 
I'm not afraid of David. He's a kid. He completely neglects to see that it was the Holy Spirit of God that granted him victory time after time. He completely forgot about the fact that he was nothing without God. He tries to justify his sinfulness, tries to you know, selfishly just dig up some more ambition and some more authority and say, well, I'm the king. I'm going to push forward. And he tries that for a while. It doesn't work because the Spirit has anointed a new king. The Spirit has come upon David in a mighty way. Now, let me just give a little side note here before we move forward. Understand this is the Old Testament. And so don't let that bring fear into your mind that you're somehow going to lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is somehow going to leave you. Because what we see, Jesus, is, you know, before he went back to heaven after the resurrection, he said, I must go so that in my go, the counselor can come to you. The Holy Spirit can come to you. He will remind you of everything I taught. He will empower you and guide you. And Jesus says, anyone who's in the Father's hands can never be plucked, right? Because you're, you're eternally secure. And so don't hear that and say, oh, man, I wonder if I've lost the Holy Spirit, right? If, you, if you've truly given your life to Christ, been regenerated, been justified because of the work that Christ did on the cross and God justifying you, then you've, the Bible says you've received the Holy Spirit as your guide, as your deposit, guaranteeing what's to come. You're not going to lose him. I just want to make that note clear because in the Old Testament, before Jesus came in the flesh, the Holy Spirit was active, but he was not you know, dwelling in the heart of every believer. He moved in specific ways and specific times under specific circumstances to bring about the will of God. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit leaving Saul and rushing upon David, that's a powerful, powerful illustration of how God works and then how his will will always be accomplished, right? But we shouldn't read that and equate that to New Testament times where we think, man, I wonder if the Spirit's with me today or not. I wonder if he was with me yesterday. If you're in Christ, you have a genuine faith, the Spirit resides within you. Now, you may yield to him better on some days than others, the Bible's clear, the Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing what is to come, that you're in Christ. So, but let's go back to 1 Samuel. So what happens here is that David is anointed by the Spirit. He's empowered, just like Saul, to do mighty, mighty things, to accomplish wonderful victories. But David also is human, and he sins horribly. We talked about that a few weeks ago. He has this horrible period of sin that affects a lot of people, brought great distress and failure upon him. But there was a difference in the way David viewed his sin and the way Saul viewed his. In fact, David wrote us a beautiful description that I prayed at the beginning of this sermon, if you picked up on that. Psalm 51 is the, kind of the, the personal confession of David after he sinned, and Nathan has come to him to reveal his sin to him. Let me just read a couple of parts of it, because it's, it's really the Old Testament picture of what the gospel does to a believer. The Old Testament picture of how we come to Christ, how we come to genuine faith. James wants us to know what genuine faith is. King David experienced it after he had sinned horribly. Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Major difference in the way David viewed his sin versus Saul. Saul tried to justify himself, tried to take matters into his own hands and continue his reign and just tough it out. Powerful King David says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a horrible sinner. You're, per you're perfect and holy and righteous, and I am none of those things. He comes to this point where he comes with a broken and contrite heart and spirit and cries out, and the Lord heals him. The Lord washes him white as snow. The Lord forgives him and justifies him. So that's step one, that's what the Spirit wants to do within us. We talk about genuine faith. This is the playbook of what genuine faith, how it comes about in the life of a believer. Step one is this gentle, contrite brokenness before the Lord, that he is perfect and holy and we are not. And then secondly, as, as David has found forgiveness Here's his second plea. He says, create in me, this is in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. So you see what happens here? When genuine repentance and forgiveness has taken place, the, step, the next step that can only follow, the only natural step, is to say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I don't just need to be better at saying no to sin. I need you to do something new in me. 
I need you to create a new thing in me, a clean heart, renew within me a spirit that is so in line with your spirit that you keep me on the path that you have set forth. David says, cast not your spirit from me. See, David knew what it looked like to have the Holy Spirit leave you. He saw it in Saul. It was horrible. Saul was extremely tormented when the Holy Spirit left him. So as David finds forgiveness, he cries out and says, Lord, please don't let your Holy Spirit depart from me. Please allow your Spirit to do in me what only it can do, and that is to cleanse me, to restore my pursuit of you, to give me a clean heart, a willing spirit, a joy that only comes from you. Renew within me the right spirit. And so that's step two of genuine faith, right, is is not only do we come to a point where we say, The only way to salvation is to be cleansed by God, and God sent his son Jesus to die for us that we could be forgiven and justified. But step two is always this idea of repentance, that it's not just a matter of one time saved and go live life. David shows us that it's this this desire to say, Lord, I can't walk this out without you, and so thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit. Please let your spirit cleanse me, change my desires, renew within me a desire to follow you and to never walk, walk astray. So that's step two. Step three is then once we've been forgiven, once we have the power of the Spirit working within us, and step three begins in verse 13, David says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You see that? That's step three. There is fruitfulness. So what David says is that salvation only comes from God. He cries out with a beautiful description of a broken heart and finds forgiveness. Step two is that, Lord, you've forgiven me now. Don't let your spirit depart from me, but cleanse me and continually work in me. And the step three, David says, and the results of that are the good works that no man can describe other than it's God. He says the result of that is that what comes out of my mouth, what shows up in my life, what is produced by my actions bring you praise. And he says this amazing thing. He says, you don't want sacrifice, otherwise I'd bring it. Right, David says, he says, God doesn't want religious activity. He doesn't want you just to give a little bit or to try hard or whatever. He says, God wants a broken and contrite spirit so that he can work within us, and then what he produces out of our life is truly glorious and beautiful. It's called good works. And so that's the progression that we see here. So as we think about that, um, I'm going to ask us a few questions. Actually, I'm going to ask myself a few questions here in just a moment about how have I viewed this, and, and I want you to ask yourself the same things. But let's talk now, before we do that, in closing, about this thought about what is genuine faith. So We've covered three things that were not genuine faith, and that's the bulk of the sermon because really if we understand what's not genuine faith, then out of that comes the description of genuine faith, right? We've said that genuine faith is not just good intentions, it's not just theological knowledge or emotion, it's not even religious accomplishments, rather genuine faith, as James says now, is a faith that works. He provides us this glorious, beautiful description of a faith that works. Right? It's not only a faith, it's a faith that works because it actually brings salvation. But it's a faith that works because once there's salvation, there are works, right? There are results. There's fruitfulness that cannot be denied. And so um, James kind of gives us two examples that are beautiful. He looks at Abraham and Rahab. Let's review both of those for just a moment. So Abraham, we know, was the Old Testament giant, the father of many nations, a a man uh, who was justified. But how was he justified? You see, Abraham didn't work for his righteousness. That would be crazy. It was a gift from God, and he knew that. He received righteousness as a free gift from God. He was declared righteous by faith. It says he was justified by faith. Justification is a very important biblical term, Old Testament and New. Right? It's this doctrine that, that justification is the act by which God declares a sinner righteous. That's what justification is. It's when God declares that a believing sinner is righteous. 
not on the basis of anything they've ever done or ever could do, but simply on the basis of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. Jesus paid our penalty for us, faced the death we deserved, did what we could not do, rose victorious, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And as a result of that, God is able to, to bring all those that come to faith in Christ to a point of declaring them righteous before himself. It's called justification. And so it's not a process. It's an act. The prerequisite for being justified was already met on the cross of Christ. And so as we come to Jesus, one time, once and for all, a genuine faith is based on the fact that God justifies you by what Christ did. He says you're righteous. You may not look righteous or feel righteous. Most of us don't, right? In fact, if we do, there's something wrong. But we are righteous when Christ says, you're mine. We place faith in him, and God justifies us by that faith. So that's what happened with Abraham. Even before, you know, that was before Jesus came in the flesh. But we know that, you know, as a result, every, all the Old Testament prophets that were believing, their, their faith was pointing to Christ, right, as a future event. So it was all through Christ. And so how can you tell if a person is justified by faith? Well, Abraham answered that question. He gave us an example that answers this question. He showed us that the justified person has a changed life and obeys God's will. His faith is demonstrated by his works, right? Because Abraham, in Genesis 22, received a word from God. God said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your beloved son, Isaac. I want you to kill him on my behalf. Well, it's not that difficult, you know, carrying out of that act that saved him. Now, that would be horrible to carry that out, right? That would be one of the most... Um, you know, drastic items or examples of obedience ever to kill your son because God told you to. But Abraham was willing, not because he thought it would save him, but because he was saved, right? We see that his faith and actions were working together. Abraham didn't obey God's difficult commands so that he could earn something. He obeyed God because he knew that his faith in God was the only thing that brought him hope. Now, thankfully, we know the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham from actually carrying out the act of sacrifice and showed that his faith was genuine and real. Uh, but Abraham's obedience showed that he had a real faith. And so we see that there's this perfect relationship between faith and works, right? As someone has beautifully expressed it, Abraham was not saved by faith plus works. He was saved by a faith that works, right? And so we see that Abraham was justified before God. He was claimed, he was pronounced fully righteous. And as a result of that, the rest of his life was full of works righteously demonstrated through God. So we see that, and we see, secondly, this idea of Rahab. Second illustration that James uses. Rahab was a prostitute. We, we learn about her in Joshua 2 and Joshua 6. Uh, kind of the background there is that the nation of Israel is about to take over the promised land, about to invade the promised land. Joshua sent some spies into the city to kind of get a lay of the land. Very dangerous for them. They met Rahab, who had a little inn, a little place where you could go. And she protected them. By doing so, she affirmed that she believed in what God had said and what God was going to do. And so when the men departed, they promised to save her and her family when the city was taken, and they did. It's an exciting story because it's one of the Bible's greatest examples of saving faith. Rahab was a prostitute that had absolutely nothing to offer God, absolutely nothing to bring about salvation or to please God or do anything of value. But she heard the word, and she believed. She believed that her city was condemned. She believed that God was going to do something. She allowed that belief to affect her in such a way that Joshua 2.11 said her heart was melted. So she responded with her mind by believing, responded with her emotions by being stirred to the point of her heart being melted, but she also responded with her will. She did something about it. She risked her own life to protect these Jewish spies. She further risked her life by sharing the good news of deliverance with her family and with others around and so she showed that she had a genuine faith. Now, she could have had a dead faith, right? She could have just merely known what God said and just left it right there. 
She could have even mingled with that, some emotional response, and been like, you know, the, the demons have a demonic faith where you know about God, and maybe you're stirred in your heart, but you don't ever really act on it. Or she, had a, she could have a dynamic faith, which she did. She knew the truth. It stirred her. She acted upon it. She exercised genuine faith. Her mind knew the truth. Her heart was stirred, and her will acted upon what she knew. She proved her faith by her works. Now, we know the Holy Spirit was, you know, in the middle of all of this. Recently read a book called Who is the Holy Spirit by, by a seminary professor named Malcolm Yarnell. This book is amazing because it, it's kind of one of its kind. Most books that have been written about the Holy Spirit talk about what the Spirit has done. This specific book, it's not a long book, but it talks about who the Spirit is. And Dr. Yarnell looks at six places in the Bible where we see who the Spirit is. And what we always see is that the Spirit, as Dr. Yarnell says, is the mighty mover. I love that description. He's the mighty mover. The Spirit is God, right? He's part of the Trinity. Um, but what we see is anytime we see the, the, the Holy Spirit in Scripture, He is moving creation closer toward the divine will of God, right? So in Genesis 1, before there was anything to compare Him to, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. And the Word of God, the Spirit of God brought life, brought creation, He was moving creation towards God's intended purpose. And then when Jesus came in the flesh and was living and teaching and and was baptized by John the Baptist, right, all three persons of the Trinity were present. Jesus the Son was there being baptized. God the Holy Spirit was hovering like a dove. And God the Father spoke and said, this is my Son in whom I am pleased. Notice that all three are present in your salvation too. Right? Jesus paved the way for you to be justified. The Holy Spirit is the one that guides you and draws you into salvation. It's God the Father that is pleased that you've been in him. But what we see here is the Holy Spirit is the, is the, is the, the, the mover, the mighty mover. And so we move forward to the Old Testament, whether it's you know, Moses or Joshua or, or any of the other you know, judges, Samuel, or what we talked about with David and Saul. The Holy Spirit is the mighty mover. His goal is to move created beings toward intended purpose of God. And so what we see here in our life is that we place our faith in Christ. The Bible says we receive the Holy Spirit. So what's the Holy Spirit's job in your life? To move you toward the intended purpose of God, to move you to spiritual maturity, to move you to a deeper level of repentance and faith and obedience, confidence and knowledge and wisdom. It's to move you to the fruitfulness that comes out of your life in the form of good works. Because if you've genuinely believed in Christ, then you possess the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not going to sit still. The Holy Spirit is the mighty mover. Now, as I said, you may may not yield to the Holy Spirit all the time. That means he's not there. His whole job is to move you toward spiritual maturity, toward completeness in Christ, toward what God has intended. So that's what James is saying here. He's saying, hey, you can do a bunch of false works that are man-based, woman-based. Just understand that's a dead faith. He said, or you can make some intellectual, you know, proclamation about something you believe and just leave it there. And he said, that's dead faith. He said, or you can genuinely believe in Christ, receive the Spirit who is the mighty mover who is constantly going to be moving you toward completeness in Christ and you just cannot sit still in that point. There is going to be valuable, fruitful activity. There's going to be good works just like Abraham, just like Rahab. He said Rahab had nothing good to offer, but because she believed God, because there were things going on in her life that were genuinely from Christ, there was evidence in her life that a genuine faith existed. So we talk about this, and we could go on and on and say more about this, but here's some questions that I'm going to ask myself, and I want you to ask yourself as well. Some of these need to be asked daily, but some of them are a one-time thing. First question that we just kept to naturally ask after we've talked about genuine faith, and specifically Psalm 51, heard from David, seen the difference between David and Saul. Let me just say this, 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this pretty plainly. promise we're almost done. 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul said, Examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Paul was speaking to believers, and he said, look, 
You can spend your whole life around religious activity. But examine yourselves. Test yourself to see whether or not you're in Christ. To see whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. To see whether or not your faith is genuine. Heaven help you that you just have a dead faith. How horrible is that? Spend your whole life thinking you have something of value to find out it's a dead faith. It's either just based in works or just based in intellect. And so here's some questions to ask as we examine ourselves. I want to ask myself this. Is there a time when I honestly realized that I'm a desperate sinner and admitted that to myself and God? It's what David did in Psalm 51. That's what Saul did not do. Saul made justification, tried to make excuses. David said, oh, Lord, you were holy and righteous. I am a worthless sinner. So has there been a time in your life when you've said, honestly, I'm a sinner, there's nothing good in me, and admit that to yourself and God. Number two, have you truly understood the gospel? That Jesus died for my sins and rose again. Do I understand and confess that I cannot save myself? That's not just a theological thought to think about. It's the absolute truth. I cannot save myself. No one's righteous, no, not one. It's only what Christ did on the cross. Thirdly, have I trusted Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. Not that I've trusted in my good works, my family heritage, my church attendance, my tithing record, or my good deeds, none of those things, but have I trusted solely in the work that Christ did for me with a, with a gentle, contrite, broken spirit, said, Lord, you hold the keys to life. Hope is only in you. It's only in what Christ did on the cross. And therefore, am I enjoying living in that relationship with him? Because Christ doesn't call us just to place our faith in him and go live life our own way. He calls us to enjoy the relationship with him through the word and through the spirit. And so that's the final question that James is really getting to is, has there been a change in my life? Not trying to turn that into some legalistic, you know, set of things where you're, you're trying to say that you don't really know Christ unless you've done these 10 things. That's not what James is saying. Because it's a different experience for every believer. It's individual. It's, it's, it's powerful. But the truth is, all of us who are in Christ have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as the mighty mover, is bringing change in the lives of believers. He's bringing fruitfulness. That's the only way it works. And so what is he doing in me today? What change is he bringing about in me? What difference is there about me? Because I have the Spirit. Because remember what David said. He cried out for forgiveness pleaded with the Lord to let the Spirit remain in him so that it would constantly be changing him and molding him and moving him because he knew then he would have genuine faith. He knew then that the outpouring of his life would be good works that are in this beautiful, intricate relationship with his genuine faith. And so those are the questions that we ask. Those are the questions that we survey as we say, I don't want just a religion. I don't want a system. I don't want a bunch of boxes to check. I want genuine, realistic faith. And God has given us the answer. It's through Christ, Christ alone. But as we know Christ, James says, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an individual fact or knowledge piece that remains by itself. It's aligned with this, what the Spirit's doing in your life. And so let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you today for this time. God, I praise you for who you are and what you've done. God, I thank you that even as wretched as we are, we can come to your word and hear directly from you. For we know that your words bring life. They brought life in creation They've sustained life throughout all the ages. They bring new life in all those who place their faith in you and what you've said and done and who you are. And so, God, today I just pray you touch every heart and every life. I pray for those that don't know you, Father, who've watched this or been a part of this service here personally. God, those that don't know you that are far from you, would you just draw them to your presence? Help them see that, that all of our man-made efforts are just futile. They don't lead to life. Just help them to see that do Christ Jesus and the work on the cross is where hope comes from, is where Life is, exists at where forgiveness comes. Father, maybe we be like David, that we cry out to you that we are sinners and we're wretched, but you are not. You are perfect and holy and righteous and hold the keys to life. But God, I pray the second prayer that we would quickly pray. Once we know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that we would echo the words of David, that, that we would ask you to continually do a new thing in us, renew within us a right spirit. We wouldn't drift, that we wouldn't go our own way, that we wouldn't be like Saul and take matters into our hands, but simply our spirit would be so in line with yours that the output of our life, the outcome of our deeds are yours. And they're glorious and victorious. They are good works that beautifully accompany genuine faith. God, we know this is only possible through you and your spirit when you work and accomplish your purpose. So I just pray you work in every heart and every life during this time, during this week to come, during all the days that are ahead of us. 
your will be accomplished. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Friends, if you'll stand this morning, we're going to have a brief moment of invitation, and here's why.